it makes me a little teary-eyed every time I hear it. <laughs> See it. So yes, I am an author, and I actually brought two of my books that I wanted to give out to anybody that reads. Um, you know, it could be toilet reading too, whichever one you, you prefer. Um, so the prescription is in the dirt. This one um, talks about my life, my journey through my own healing process, how I had to crawl through it, and the way that God showed up for me. So are there any readers in here? Anybody that reads? Anybody? There we go. Okay. Well, you're in the first. <laughs> and then this one is actually about my parenting. Okay. I have boys. And so uh, I have a very, anybody, is there boy moms? Okay. So you, know, you understand that the parenting method when it comes to boys is a little special. And so I talk a lot about that in, in this book and it really just, um, talks a lot about generational habits and how the things that we've learned, how sometimes we transfer it. And they can be wonderful habits, but also some not so wonderful, some embarrassing moments. Any, a boy mom, can I get a boy mom? There you go, here you go. There you go, enjoy. Well, thank you. Thank you guys so much for the welcome. When Pastor Patrick asked me, um, I gotta be honest, um, I halfway um, threw up in my mouth, but then I was just like, um, you know, then I started thinking, I'm like, well, we are technically going to be moving in, a few, uh, in a, a few weeks to Texas. So by the time I say anything and embarrassing and he hears about it and he wants to chastise, I'm going to be out. So it's like, then I was like, let's do it. Let's, let's do this thing. Yes, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about my family. Um, I am a mother of four boys, and uh, they are 22, 15, I think there's a picture, yep, um, 11 and 8, and then I have bonus girls who are, I'm guessing here, 21 and 31, something around there. <laughs> and then um, I am also a wife. I am a wife to my best friend. We've been married for, it will actually be 11 years, um, July 4th. And so I think that deserves an applause. I mean, that's work. <laughs> um, yeah, so July 4th, it was one of those things. He finally, you know, he finally got there and it was just like, kids, we're going to the chapel, let's go, you know? Oh my God, it's like, hurry up, dude. So, so yeah, that's my family and um, forgiveness. That is what I'm up here to talk about, forgiveness. I'm definitely well vested in the forgiveness area on both sides, having to forgive and also preparing my heart to ask for forgiveness because that's not always easy, right? So I got a few examples that I'm gonna share and I'm just sharing it with you guys, don't tell nobody. Um, so one example is my son, he turned five and so for his fifth birthday, um, for his birthday celebration, we took him for dinner at Hooters. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. We thought it was a good idea at the time. I mean, maybe it was, we were hungry, I don't know, but we really thought it was a good idea. And then when I saw him looking at the girls, I was like, mm, maybe this isn't the best parenting moment. Definitely had to ask for forgiveness from some aunts and some grandparents. I mean, you know, it happens. Um, that probably don't happen that often, but it happens. Uh, oh, my son, who, spit, he cost me 300 and something dollars on my car because he was playing some online game and I guess you had to pay to go up a, a, a level or something, I don't know. And it, my, my car was on file and my account went overdraft, 300 and something dollars and I had to fight to get my money back, but I'm so over it. Can't you tell? I'm so over it. And um, I'm not even gonna say who it is because I got four, y'all can just try to figure it out. I'm not even gonna go there. I'm not gonna say his name because it's not cool to be putting your kids on blast like that. But he is one of the camera people, so y'all can just turn around and say, hey, cameraman. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love you. Mommy loves you, baby, mommy loves you. <sighs> then there was that time, ugh, the chick at Golden Corral. The chick at Golden Corral, we leave it and she say, oh my God, congratulations. How many months are you? And I wasn't. I'm like, oh, 
MG, my husband thought that was the funniest thing. I mean, he just thought that was the funniest thing, relationship goals, for real. He just, he, he really ran with that. But yeah, so um, I am, again, a mother of four boys, but I also grew up with all um, brothers. So I have five brothers. I'm the only girl. I'm a little rough around the edges. If you haven't been able to tell just yet, just keep listening. <laughs> you know, figure it out. I'm a little rough around the edges. Um, so something that you may not know about me is that I actually grew up a Buddhist, um, Nichiren Daishonin Buddhism to be exact. If you ever seen the movie, What's Love Got to Do With It, the Tina Turner movie, has anybody seen that movie? If you haven't, you really should watch it. It's, it's quite, an, it, it's a good movie. Um, but yeah, at the end of the movie, um, she's introduced to a religion. And so that was my generational religion. It was handed down by my maternal grandmother. And so my mom is a Buddhist. Buddhist, my brothers are Buddhist, my aunts and uncles are Buddhist, and I was actually the first person in my immediate family to transition to Christianity. And the reason why I share that is because there was a moment where actually my, my family, we decided, or not me, but my mom decided that uh, she wanted to go to church. And so there was a neighborhood, uh, a church, and there was a preacher that was always on the radio saying, come to the church. And, and so one day my mom just said, get dressed, we're going to church. And so we went and it was just like, it was just like the most coolest thing, like all the music was awesome, and the prayer, and just, it was just something that we were not used to. We didn't pray in that way. So it was completely different and mesmerizing, and we just got hooked. And so I joined the, uh, the choir, my mom joined the choir because I got it from her. <laughs> and um, my brother, he's, he was 10 at the time, and he actually played the drums for the church. So it was a smaller church, but he was, he was playing the drums. We were so invested. And so one Saturday, we came um, to church for choir rehearsal, and the, the pastor and two deacons were waiting outside, and they um, would not allow us to come into the church. Um, they basically banned us and because of our past religion. And uh, we were just like, what? They could not get over the fact that we used to be Buddhist. They could not forgive our past. And so we were just so humiliated and just, I can't even explain, I mean, you could just think about it. How would you feel, right, if that, if that was you and your family? My mom is standing there and we had to get back in the car. And it really, truly um, put a negative imprint on how we viewed Christianity and really how we viewed Christians for a very long time. So I'm sure you can imagine the interesting conversation when I actually told my family that I was becoming a Christian. That's a story for another time. We won't talk about that today. But yeah, forgiveness, you know, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're, we're um, you know, we're gonna dive into. If I can be really honest, the whole process of forgiveness, like walking through the whole process of forgiveness, it truly does, just like what it say. It can really suck. I mean, am I the only one that feel that way? Like, seriously, am I the only one? Like, it really just the process of like getting to that spot, right? And just what it takes out of you, it truly can be so uncomfortable, like so painful. You know, I can, I feel it, I feel it, you know? And it's just like, it costs so much. Who I think about, the, who sacrificed the most was Jesus. I mean, he died on the cross for our sins. Like he bled out. He was broken and ridiculed and mocked so that we will be forgiven and so that we will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. And that is a beautiful testament of what love looks like, what forgiveness looks like. But I cannot relate. <laughs> like, like, I'm not doing that for nobody, <laughs> like, you know? I mean, okay, my kids, uh, depends on which one, and depends on, you know, who's my favorite at the time. I'm just saying, it's like, we're gonna have to talk about this before I sacrifice myself, and you want me to know I'm gonna sacrifice myself? You better have to clean your room, you better have to brought me good grades, like, you better have to had it together, <laughs> you know what I mean? But on a humanistic side, on a humanistic side, tell me if I'm wrong. Forgiveness, it can, it costs, it costs pride, right? It costs us so much pride, like we have to humble ourselves to be able to see somebody else's perspective, to be able to say, you know what? People make mistakes, I've made mistakes, God, you forgave me. 
I'm going to forgive. I'm just going to forgive. Forgiveness, it can cost entitlement, like the self-righteous anger that a lot of times we, we, are, we earn that anger, right? And we have been wrong, yet we have to say, okay, I'm releasing it. I'm releasing it, and I'm going to try to see their viewpoint outside of my pain. That can be tough, and I think that's why a lot of people don't try to do it. You know, they just say, I'm just going to hold on to this, you did me dirty, and that's just, that's just the severing of our relationship, and that's it. I've totally been there. There are a couple scriptures that I definitely like to lean on when I'm walking through that emotional space where I'm stuck in the process of forgiveness, and the scriptures can be found in the book of Matthew, and Matthew was a disciple of Jesus who basically Jesus taught him one-on-one. -on -one. He had a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, okay? Um, and, and so what he did was he just kind of like wrote a chapter in the Bible of his accounts of when, he would, when he was walking with Jesus. And so there are some scriptures in Matthew. And so the first um, scripture, they're gonna put it up here, is Matthew 6, 14 through 15. And it says, in prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. And so I relate to this scripture in a way, but how I relate to it is kind of like, I don't know, like the way I grew up. And so the way I grew up was this, okay? I got brothers, and I can talk about their big head, their big head itself, right? I can talk about them. But you can't talk about them. So if you say you cool with me, but you not cool with my brothers, then you ain't cool with me. We cool, but we ain't cool, right? I mean, that's just how I grew up. Did anybody else grow up? Like, you don't talk about my family, right? And so to me, that's what Jesus is saying. It's like, how can you ask me to forgive you when you don't even have the heart enough to forgive the, 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 my children, the people that I love just as much as I love you? That's like, that's like an oxymoron. Not calling you a moron, I'm just saying. That's like an oxymoron, right? And so the second scripture I like to lean on is Matthew 6, 14 through 15. And it says, this is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then, come back and work things out with God. And that is a, around the same context. We will go to God and say, oh my God, I love you. I surrender myself to you. I offer myself. God, use me, you know, stretch me, and all these nice Christianese things that we say, right? But if we know that there is somebody that has an awe against us, basically have been offended by something they believe that we did, whether we did it or not, whether we meant it that way or not, they are offended and we don't try to make it right, yet we come to God and say, Lord God, I love you so much. Well, the, the most powerful example of love was him dying on the cross so that we could be forgiven, yet we can't go and try to make a situation right with someone. It's, it don't go together. They don't go together. And so these are the two scriptures that I definitely uh, lean on because I get stuck too. Tony Robbins, he said it this way. He said that forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. And I truly believe that because in all actuality, forgiveness is more for yourself than it is for the other person. I've lived it and I've experienced it. And I remember when I used to hear that, it would be like, that is so cheesy. But it's true. When you walk through the forgiveness process and the the release that you feel afterwards, it is so much more so satisfying, you know, more so than for the other person. They may or may not even accept it, but the fact that you have resolved it within yourself, it is just like euphoric in some ways, right? There are three key things that I um, know to be true about forgiveness, the act of forgiveness, the process of forgiveness, and one is forgiveness is self-love. It is releasing the pain that has steered the direction of your life. It's releasing it and saying this will no longer 
manage and direct the way I live. It would no longer dictate my friendships and the, and the way that I do business and the way that I view people. I'm releasing myself from that pain. The second thing that uh, forgiveness does, it, it brings freedom. Well, when you release yourself, you have more freedom. You feel more relaxed. It's like carrying a backpack full of bricks and then you just drop it. How much more relaxed do you feel? You know, it is just, it, sometimes it even feels weird because you've been carrying it for so long and then you drop it and it's like something's missing. I feel like something's missing, right? Uh, the third thing that I know to be true about forgiveness is it brings healing, it brings restoration, it restores relationships, restores families, restores friendship, but it also restores your peace of mind. My kids, the younger ones, they do this thing where they assign me to be their judge and jury. I don't know why they don't go to their dad. They always come to me. It's like, no matter where I'm at, I could be in the bathroom and they're putting their fingers up under the door and like trying to talk to me. It's like, I can't find no privacy. Anyway, aren't they cute? I love them. <laughs> they do this thing where, so they, somebody's wrong. Somebody's wrong, we just don't know who. And they both come and they're like, mommy, such and such did this, and, and he owes me an apology, and he's like, no, -uh, no, I didn't, because you did this, and blah, blah, blah. Like, how many have, have experienced that, right? No, I did it, you did it, and da, da, da. Okay, that doesn't warrant you kicking him in the face. I oh, know, but he did this, and yada, yada, right? And so then I'm in the middle, and I have to basically deal with the prosecutor and the defendant. And I'm the one that comes in and says, okay, well, technically, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that. No, you shouldn't have kicked, no, no, you shouldn't have kicked him in the face. No, there's no reason to kick him in the face and you need to apologize, okay? And so once we get to the place of who was wrong and who needs to apologize, the one I say, you ask him for forgiveness. Ask him, don't just say I'm sorry, ask him for forgiveness. And before the one that's wrong can really get out, will you forgive me? The other one has already released it and he says, it's okay, it's okay. And then they hug and it's beautiful and I wish I had my camera and I always miss those moments but I wish I had it on camera because one day I wanna be able to show them that they actually liked each other, right? And I always miss those moments. But I think it's interesting that they're so young yet they understand the value in forgiveness and they understand the value of validation and vindication at such a young age. I didn't teach them that, they just know that. And it's the same way we feel as adults. We wanna be validated. We want our pain to be validated. If you did me wrong, I want you to tell me that you know you did me wrong. And when a person doesn't give us that, it just, just, it just stews within us. It's like it's hard for us to let it go because they didn't sign off on the fact that they hurt us like they did, right? And God tells us we are to forgive and to live a, a posture worthy of forgiveness. That is what we're supposed to do as a Christian. So sidebar, if you're not a Christian, <laughs> I mean, you don't have to worry about that part, but, <laughs> but that is our charge, that we are supposed to forgive and to carry a posture worthy of forgiveness. Now, I can say for myself, my um, posture is a little different. Uh, or my process is a little different in regards to um, how I work through the process of forgiveness. My process involves a whole lot of therapy, a whole lot of prayer, and a program called Celebrate Recovery. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but what I really want y'all to do is just, can y'all check me out? Because I really tried today. Um, I really tried. Um, but what I want you to do is just look right here because I want to make sure that we level set and y'all know who y'all listening to, right? Who is this chick? Okay, Pastor Patrick did something nice, but who is this chick? I am the face of deformity. I have um, burns on 25% of my body, primarily on my legs and my feet. I know what it's like for people to talk to me, but stare at my feet. I know what it's like for grown-ups to be more cruel than kids. I know what it's like for somebody to tell me that I'm ugly because of my burns. 
I am the face of child abuse. My stepfather, when he would get drunk, he would beat me and my older brother for sport. And my mom couldn't help us because he was beating her too. I am the face of sexual abuse. My other stepfather, he would on purpose make my mom so angry so that she would leave the house so that he would be able to come into my room and have his way. And then when, um, well, I'll just say, he was able to come back and stay in the same home as me um, twice in my teenage years. I am the face of domestic violence because I married my rescuer and I thought that he would keep me safe and that I would never hurt again. And in actuality, it was just about the same or even worse. And when I shared with those people that were most close to me, nobody told me to leave. I am the face of a mother who has lost a child. I told you about my, my boys and my girls, but before there was ever any of them, I had a daughter, her name was Kiara, and she lived five hours. And I never got a chance, well, I didn't get a chance to hold her until she passed away. I am the face of a parent who has a child with a chronic disease that can lead to death. And when that happened, it was just like, God, really? You, I, I lost a child, and now you want me to have the fear of losing a child? I am the face of so much disappointment, so much disappointment in my life that it drove me to anxiety and depression. It's just, how do you put that in words? Well, I guess I did, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is just like a lot of stuff. But I am also the face of victory. I am the face of joy. I'm the face of peace. I'm the face of praise. I'm the face of forgiveness and purpose. Because all those things that I just shared with you, thank you, Jesus. All those things that I just shared with you is the reason why I'm here today. I would not have been able to be here talking to you if I would not have walked through all of that. T.D. Jake says it like this. He says that God takes you and then he blesses you immeasurably and then he allows the world to break you so that you can lean on him and then he grows you and then gives you to the world. And so God took me and then he blessed me and then he allowed the world to break me and for me to walk through all those tragedies and pains so that I would get on my knees and ask him why, but also say, yet will I praise you and also say, I surrender to you. And then that opened up the door for him to use me in immeasurable ways. And I'm so grateful for that. But that is also what he wants to do to you. You can't get to the peace without going through the pain. You just can't. But God never wastes pain. There is always a purpose, even if you don't understand what it is. There is always a purpose, but it comes with trusting God that he's going to reveal it in one way or another. Now I'm able to share my stories and speak into the lives of people that I never would have been able to speak into because I've walked it myself. God is so great. I talked to you guys about, I said my process of forgiveness was a whole lot of therapy. <laughs> now you understand why. <laughs> therapy and a whole lot of prayer and Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is a Christian program that um, deals with all hurts and hangups that you may have to help you basically face your mess and to assess and to really get to a place of healing. And so it can be anything, divorce, um, anxiety, codependency, anger, anything that you could think of. 
if, if anything that you have a hurt or hang up about, anything that riles you up when you start to talk about it, there is a chair at the table for you at Celebrate Recovery. And so I went to Celebrate Recovery about three years ago, and now I, I try to stay um, consistent with, with going to the, the meetings and things like that when I have time. But a part of the process is making amends. So I could go figure. A part of the process is making amends and basically um, forgiving people and forgiving yourself and doing a personal inventory of your life and of those things that, that are hurts and hangups in your life and just looking at them and facing them and digging through the dirt without running away. That's what it's about. And so I, I had to do that step. But when I was about to do the step, God brought somebody to my mind that was the farthest from my mind. And it was my father. And I'm like, huh? Do I got one of them? <laughs> so it's like, where he been? Um, so, okay, no offense, Dad. <laughs> but, anyway, but he gave me permission to talk about him. But the, the interesting thing is my dad was never a part of my life. For like 45 years of my life, he was not a part of my life. So basically when my mom got pregnant, he went off to college and then when he, um, I don't know, felt guilty, he decided that he wanted to help my mom parent me. By the time he got back, my stepfather was in the picture and he would literally try to fight my dad. I mean like fight my dad so that he wouldn't be around me. It was just crazy. So by the time they were able to reconcile all that drama, Fatima was no longer a factor. He just stopped coming around. And so when I was going through child abuse with the same person that was trying to fight him, he was not around. When I was going through the sexual abuse and I was removed from my home so that I could be protected and went to my grandparents' home where he lived, he was not there. I truly grew up a fatherless child. And so when it came time for me to graduate, I was just like, I want him to come so bad. Ugh, I'm afraid to ask him, but I really want him to come. So I called him and I asked him and it's like, you know, will you please come to my graduation? I'm graduating with honors. And then without any hesitancy, he said no. And I just felt stupid. I just felt so, ugh, like why did I even do that? Like, I knew he was going to say, no. like, why would I put myself in that situation? And so I made a decision that day that I would never ask him for another thing in my life. Never if I can help it. And furthermore, I'm going to make it to where I don't need anybody's help ever in my life. I'm going to do the best I can to stand on my own too. I'm not asking nobody for nothing. And that's how I live my life. And so when it got to the part where now I got to make amends 45 years later, it's like, where do you start? But I followed the process, and I listened to God, and I, I, I used the model that Celebrate Recovery offers. And that model is, you take a piece of paper and you, and you write down, who is the person that your hurt or hang up is about? What was a specific situation that happened? How did it make you feel? What damage happened? Who was at fault? And then now what? And so I did that with my dad. And so it was, my dad is, a, is the uh, specific person. He didn't come to my graduation. That's the, that's the specific situation. How to make me feel, I felt stupid. That I called him, I felt embarrassed, I felt abandoned, just all of that. And then how did it damage me? I said I would never ask him for another thing in my life. And then who's at fault? Well, clearly, Stevie Wonder can see that he's at fault, right? <laughs> he didn't even show up in my life. However, I was also at fault because I allowed that pain to fester in my life all these years and direct my relationships and close off to people so that when I was in the pit of my anxiety and depression, I, did, I, I was too prideful to ask for help. So I was suffering in silence by myself. And what do I want? What do I want now? Well, shoot, I want to be free. I don't want this no more. I don't want to be thinking about this thing no more. And I don't want to be in pain every time I think about that incident. I want to just be free. And it was once I went through that process with every hurt and hang up in my life, but specifically this one, is when God started to work a miracle in my life. And so I prayed and I asked God to heal me off from these hurts and these hang ups. And then God, when he was ready, 
he took me the next step, and that was to have a conversation with my father, a conversation, two adults sitting and talking about our relationship, something I had never done in 45 years. And so I'm so grateful that I did do that because now we have a flourishing relationship and he got to meet his grandchildren for the first time, and which, which by the way, they thought he was dead. I mean, I didn't tell him he was dead, it's just he was never around, right? Um, and so I got to have my first father and daughter date at like 45 and I was all scared. <laughs> and then in January, I was able to go home and celebrate my 47th birthday uh, with him for the first time. And so I had a lot of firsts and I'm sure there are still so many more firsts that are out there, but it never would have happened if I wouldn't have given the gift of going first. If I wouldn't have said, God, I'm going to honor what you say, and I'm going to go first regardless of, of him validating my pain or not, because you are my validator, right? So by faith, I'm going to walk these steps. If I wouldn't have did that, I wouldn't have a relationship. I wouldn't have had a relationship. So some people, they say, well, if I forgive, then the thing is just going to happen all over again. You know, I'm going to be back in this drama with the same person, and it's just not even worth it, because all they're going to do is do the same thing. Forgiveness and boundaries are two completely different things. There are some people who are repeat offenders, okay? And they haven't healed themselves to be able to come back into your life. They have their own stuff that they got to deal with. But that has nothing to do with releasing the pain from your heart and forgiving them. Those are two completely different things. But I want to challenge that, that comment that it'll, it'll just be the same way. I say to that, if you do not forgive the person that has hurt you, then they will own you. I'll say it again. If you do not forgive the person that hurt you, they will own you. They will own your peace. They will own your joy. They will own your dreams. They will own your relationships. They will own your present. And they will own your future. And why would you give somebody that have hurt you that type of ownership over you? We are charged to forgive and to carry the posture worthy of forgiveness. Now imagine. Imagine if you would apply any of the things that I've shared with you today to your life. Imagine if you would give the gift of going first and if you would forgive your father. Imagine if you would forgive your ex. Imagine if you would forgive your sister. Imagine if you'd forgive your daughter. Imagine if you forgave yourself. Imagine if you forgave God. How much weight would be lifted off your shoulders? How much freer you would feel? You know, all it takes is a decision. That's all it is, it's just a decision that I'm choosing to no longer do the other and I'm going to baby step my way, going this way. It's just a decision. There's a, a prayer that I love, and it is also recited in Celebrate Recovery. And um, it is a serenity prayer. And I know they'll put it up on the screen, but there is a part in the serenity prayer, number one, we probably all know it to some extent. We always just say the half part, and then we just be done. <laughs> But um, in Southern Recovery, say the entire thing, and it really has held me up uh, going through tough times and working through my own healing journey. And there are parts of the serenity prayer that really speak to me. And um, one of those parts is, it says, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Every time I read that, it speaks to me because it's true. Hardship is the pathway to peace. And we can't go around it. It's just a part of life. And for me, if I'm going to go through hardship because I'm breathing and that's just a part of life, 
I prefer to go, to go through hardship holding God's hand instead of doing it by myself. You can't hold on to bitterness and anger and to God's unchanging hand at the same time. God wants both our hands holding on to him. You gotta make a decision. Which one matters more? Your anger, your resentment, your bitterness, or God? There's another part that says, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. And that's really what it's all about. It's about surrender. Surrender, saying, God, you know what? This hurt me, this devastated me, but yet will I trust you? You are the maker of all things, so I gotta believe that there is a purpose for why I've gone through what I've gone through. And I'm gonna seek out that purpose instead of being a slave to blame. I would love for us to end with reading the serenity prayer together. It just, it's a very meaningful prayer and, and, and I pray that um, what I've talked about today that we'll meditate, you'll meditate on it. But um, can you guys read that with me? It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Thank you for having me.